All right, so by now you should be reading through um, Lawrence Lessig's uh, book, Remix. Again, who knows if you are or you aren't, and it is what it is, right? Um, but do your best to get through. It's not that horrible of a text. I kind of I kind of like it and um, whatever. So we'll talk about some of the ideas that he had. So I always like to ask you this. Like, y'all have written, you know, um, papers, right, where you quote or paraphrase an author. And what do you have to do, right? You write a term paper for a class, research paper. What do you have to do? Do you have to call the book publisher or the author? Do you have to pay them? Do you have to get a license? No, you cite, right? You just cite them. You just say it wasn't my work. And guess what? The cite is sufficient payment. Imagine if at the end of the term where you're trying to rush through and pound out all these term papers, research papers, if you had to cop, uh, contact every um, book publisher, uh, academic demic journal publisher, and all the authors involved the, you know, in this process, whether it is the juristic authors, the companies who own the publishing rights, or the natural authors who wrote the books, and get friggin' permission. You'd never write a text, you know, a paper. You never finish a paper. Even if it's commercially, like say you write like an academic book or a book, like it could be a popular press book where you're citing sources. You don't have to you don't have to pay for that. The site is considered a sufficient payment. And this is super, super duper important. So like it's weird because the site is is enough, you know, and this is what Lessig says makes writing democratic, is that we can all create with writing. We can all sample and we can all remix. We can all borrow with this type of writing where we're writing with the written word. But the interesting thing is this, is like, how do a lot of us write now? How do we write now? Is it the written word? I think in like uh, some of your classes, you know, you may be writing like video essays, right? Where you're bringing in clips and then you're narrating stuff to do like a video essay or use, you know, whatever, um, you know. But we write in a different way, like that's a way of writing or we communicate in a different way where we do, we, we're, it's so easy for us to download and, and grab bits and pieces of culture and put them together and we write with things like video editing software or, or DAWs or, or Photoshop or things like that where we're, we're taking other people's texts in some ways and we're combining them, we're transforming and combining them and writing in a different way. However, to do this, even non-commercially, but to do this commercially, just citing your, your, your sources is not enough. It's not enough permission. Just like when you write a book, the citation is enough. That form of writing, a citation is enough. But when you write with light or you write with audio, right, that's different types of writing, the site is not sufficient enough. You, you, need to, um, you need to pay. You need to get a license. When we think about this, it's called uh, permission, right? And permission isn't just like call up the author of a book or call up the, you know, uh, recording artist and be like, yo, can I use your stuff? Because you know what? They may not be the author by law. The author by law of most most music that you've ever heard is a corporation, the record label, that's the author by law of that content. Okay, so in this way, Lessig says that, you know, um, this is not as democratic, you know, but the interesting thing is this. Um, would you, if I said, yo, sit down and read this book by Larry Lessig, it's going to take you a day. And there's some pretty, you know, complex ideas in here, right? And you do that. And, you know, that's maybe hard for you, right? Or maybe you don't do it because fuck it, I don't, want, I don't want to do it, right? Or I'm going to get bored after chapter two. But if I say, hey, watch this 50-minute documentary that explores all the ideas that Lessig talks about, you may do it. And you may also come out of it with a better understanding of the topic right because you're being shown stuff and you're and you're you're hearing stuff and you're seeing it and it's all synthesizing versus someone talking about moving images talking about music in a book so that also <clears throat> makes that type of writing democratic for the users like people can consume very complex ideas 
with that type of writing, light and audio writing, versus the, you know, the reading books, right? So academic ideas, right? It's a very democratic way of creating them. You can create them very easily by citation. But on the flip end, right, some of the books that I'm sure your, your professors have you read, you don't fucking know, like, half the crap they're talking about in, in those. Because, like, there's always just, like, one little bit that's just important that's buried in a mass of jargon and, you know, people trying to, you know, be self-important and self-indulgent by using big words and, you know, all, all that stuff. But um, I think he makes this point that, you know, we write in a different way now. That is actually pretty democratic because we can make images and moving images and music on our phones and share them through our phones, etc. So that's demo, you know, democratic um, in a way. And that people can also consume those things in a very democratic way and get access to more information um, and content in a better way. But legally, right, it's harder to author in that way. So legally, it's less democratic. It's just kind of the paradox that he, he presents us with, right? Like the text that's harder for us to make sense out of, which is the written word that maybe less people can read an academic book and understand the jargon because you need a friggin' terminal degree to understand it, right? Um, but it's democratically created in the sense of anybody can write that and cite and it's, it's totally, totally fine. But on the flip end, if you take those complex ideas and make them into a movie, right, it's let it, to do that legally, it's less democratic, although the consumption of it and production of it is fairly democratic. It's less democratic. So he says there's a couple significances of Remix, and this is where I'm going to leave it. The significance of this is that it creates community. There's a community of Remixers. You think of all the people that do, you know, Harry Potter fan art, or people that vid, or people that do video game modding, or people that, you know, um, you know, engage in these fan cultures, animated music videos, what he talks about, where people take Japanese anime and they edit it to um, songs and make music videos. And there's a whole culture around it. And there's interesting, like, um, subcultural hierarchies where there's subcultural capital involved. But it creates a community and there's, you know, stars in the community and um, all, all that stuff around this remi of these forms of remixing. So that's number one. Number two, he says it makes for a more like media literate um, group of people. So like in the sense of like, yeah, like you learn how to edit video or how to do graphic design by like learning how to use the software, by using other people's stuff and creating that way. So that makes it, you know, um, you know educational. But you also learn to like like by doing like mashups and remixes and creating in this sort of way, it also allows you to become more media literate, meaning you understand not only how is media made, but like what does it mean? And you often play with that meaning through your remixes, you know. Um, and what he says, and I love this quote, is that digital technologies have removed the economic sensor. This is so important. The economic sensor is the professional. Um, I'll, I'll use my example. When I was like trying to make films and stuff uh, in the mid '90s, to kind of date myself, um, you know, number one, it was expensive to shoot on film. It was expensive to develop it. Um, you know, I couldn't edit it. I had to go. You know, I had to go to a facility, to a vocational school, to edit film and video on a ten thousand dollar linear editing machine. You know, and then what do you? How do you distribute it? How would I get that distributed? Maybe on like a local TV network, but no one's gonna just show it. I can't broadcast it to the world. I can't, you know, I had no distribution platform, right? Like there was not, none of that that would exist. You know, you had to go through the economic sensor of, oh, I make a film, oh, I make a song or an, an album or a demo, and you had to get it somehow to a record label or a film studio that would want to develop it or put, put you out. And that was the economic sensor. Number one, number two, you also had to have access to the equipment, the recording studio, the film equipment, et cetera, et cetera. That's all kind of like wiped out 
with digital, digital technology. You can shoot and edit on your phone. You can make music on your phone, on your computer. You can distribute it that way. So that makes like digital technologies have erased the gatekeeper of who lets things in and out. Now it also means that there's a ton of bullshit out there on the internet that people call music, that people call movies, that people call photography, but whatever. It's like everybody gets to create. And, and in that sea of turd, there's diamonds that would have never made it through the economic um, sensors or the gatekeepers of the past, the mass media era, right? Now that we're in the read, write, new media era, you know, those, those economic sensors um, and gatekeepers are kind of gone. There's no one, you know, that's regulating the flow of content anymore. Anyways, we made it through week two. You have survived. I hope you are doing well. I can't wait to see you in our, uh, you know, Monday afternoon, 4 p.m., uh, happy hours. Hope to join you. Um, you know, take care of yourselves. Um, take care of your family. Enjoy the outdoors if you can. Uh, if you're in, this, in the city, stay the fuck inside. <laughs> um, but hope you're well. Take care, and we will catch you on the flip. Peace. I'm out. Real Dr. Dre, no doubt.